Thanks very much, Dan, and thanks everyone for, for joining us today. So what I'm going to talk about today is how we can um, more fully exploit the design freedoms that additive manufacturing uh, presents to us. Before I get into the, the detail, I'm just going to give you a, a slide showing a couple of examples of components that have been designed using the methodology that we've been developing at the University of Sheffield for the last uh, few years. So typically, we're talking about metallic components, um, and typical applications will be high-end aerospace automotive for now. But in the future, uh, potentially, we could be looking at a much broader range of applications on the technology. So background is, um, as I said, we have increased design freedoms with additive manufacturing. But how on earth do we um, fully exploit that currently? that the methods available can be quite cumbersome, time consuming to use, which is hampering um, their usage in practice. So here, we're looking at a completely new approach to solving the, the problem. So before I get into the details of the, the new approach, just for those of you not familiar with the area, just say a few words about the traditional approach that people have, have tended to adopt when they've been looking for new forms that they can additively manufacture. So the main technique has been something called topology optimization. So what is topology optimization? Well, basically, if you have a, a design space, you don't know um, what the best form is, how, how, how that design space should be occupied. What you do is you mesh that with a finite element mesh. Um, so in 3D, you maybe have a, kind of a, a voxelated uh, mesh. And then what you do in simplistic terms is you remove low stress elements to reveal the um, optimized uh, form. So imagine a, a sculpture working on a block of stone, chipping away the low-stressed areas to reveal, in this case, a, a crude version of a half bicycle wheel, a bit like a, a kind of a, a Minecraft-type uh, structure. Good points about topology optimization. Um, it works pretty well when the volume fraction is quite high. So in other words, if you're chipping away a relatively small amount of material, then it works reasonably well. It also um, has been developed over many years, so we have quite well um, um, developed software packages. So those of you familiar with the field will know packages such as Optistruct, Solid Thinking Inspire, um, Trueform, and the like. Um, and that many of those tools allow you to optimize for a wide variety of criteria. So those are good things about the uh, um, current topology optimization approach. However, there are problems. It doesn't work nearly so well when the volume fraction is low, or in other words, if you have a lot of design freedom. Um, one of the, the sort of problems with it is that the user needs to specify a volume fraction in advance. So what you need to do is say, for example, what is the best form assuming 30% of my design space is occupied by material? Um, you do the optimization, and then you might find that actually the stresses are too high, so you try again with 50%. And you have to fiddle around in the long-winded process. Um, also. The solution is sensitive to numerical parameters. And perhaps the biggest issue is time-consuming remodeling to convert a sort of uh, a pixelated structure or, or mesh structure into something that you can actually work with um, as a, a viable component. Here's um, an example that was, was put into the public domain a couple of years ago. Um, many positives to, to this particular example. It's a satellite mount. So they were able to shave off a large amount of material using the poly optimization approach. However, you can see there's a number of steps. And each of those steps is, is time consuming. Uh, so for example, for the conceptual optimization, there were several hundred thousand finite elements. So the runtime was long. Uh, and trying the, the optimization with a number of different um, volume fractions, the whole process is, is lengthy. And that's before you come to the issue of actually converting your um, topology optimization uh, outcome in green into a, a CAD model. And what you um, often have to do is use human judgment to convert that form, um, the raw form, into something that's usable. So you can see here, there's a slightly fuzzy area 
in the top circle that's been converted into a, a, um, a cross brace in the bottom model. Um, similarly, we've actually got a straight element in the top model that's been converted into a curved element in the bottom model. I'm not quite sure uh, what the rationale for that was. Uh, similarly, uh, last year there was another nice example showing good uh, reduction in volume, but some strange um, features in the, in the design. So again, we have curved elements, which we know as structural um, engineers is not the most efficient. If you're getting a force from this point to this point, then the best way of achieving that is to do a straight line. If you have forces in slightly different orientation, then it's best to actually have two straight lines and a tie. And actually, we know from the fundamental theorem that we developed about 100 years ago that the best situation is to have compression and tension members around 90 degrees to each other. So what we've been doing is looking at a different approach which takes advantage of that understanding of structural optimization theory. So rather than using the finite element representation, what we do is we represent the, the component as a series of discrete structural members. So high-level structural members rather than low-level finite elements. And then we convert the line elements into a continuum ready for verification and or manufacture. Dan, when he was introducing me, said I was from academia, so I, I, I like to show um, um, a nice uh, dusty academic uh, paper uh, image or two. Th these two images are from 1904. Um, but what they tell us is that if you have um, an optimized truss, that the tension and compression elements should be at 90 degrees. So here we have a force, a support, and elements in tension and compression intersecting at 90 degrees to each other. You may say, how much does that matter? Actually, got an example here. Three brackets, very simple brackets. One where the tension and compression members are orthogonal, one where they're at 45 degrees, and one where they're at uh, 22 and a half degrees. The volume of the first truss is less than half the volume of the last truss. So actually, abiding by those, those rules makes a difference. The question, however, is how do we generate optimum trusses using computational methods? We don't want to be going around you know, trying every possible combination. Um, fortunately, about 50 years ago, a computational method was developed. Um, what they basically um, suggested is that if you have a design domain, a design space, what you could do is you could populate that design space with nodes, you inter interconnect those nodes with discrete structural members, and then you use optimization to find the, the best possible um, or the most efficient design um, for, for that particular design universe, so to speak. In this particular case, we've got quite a few, relatively few nodes, so the angles between the tension and compression elements are not close to 90 degrees. If we put more nodes in, we'd get a closer approximation to 90 degrees. In terms of the maths, it's actually quite simple. Um, we're minimizing the volume, which is simply the area times the length of all the members, subject to equilibrium. So that's, that's from those of you who have done A-level physics or even GCSE physics, um, equilibrium in the x direction, all the forces must sum to zero, equilibrium in the y direction, z direction must all sum to zero. It's a very simple mathematical approach and we can solve very, very large problems of this sort. Myself and a colleague at the University of Sheffield about 10, 12 years ago um, produced um, a method of solving problems with potentially billions of potential connections, and they can all solvable on a, a desktop PC. So one of the problems, however, is that when you have relatively large numbers of nodes, you can end up, because of the, the fixed locations of those nodes in a grid, you can end up with design solutions that are a little bit uh, complicated. So here we have uh, a raw design developed using layout optimization. 
But what we can do is we can adjust the positions of the nodes using something called geometry optimization to further improve the solution, but more importantly, to simplify it. And so here we can see the geometry optimization process in action. And so we have a solution on the right now, which is simpler, but also more efficient than the, um, the one on the left. Because we're dealing with high-level structural members, we can also interact with the design much more readily than we can with a mesh of voxel output from a topology optimization. So for example, if we want to remove some fine elements, we can it, it simply uh, remove them. Um, we also, because we have tension and compression members that are, are inclined at a particular angle, we can actually estimate the structural efficiency of the design and we can estimate what the influence of changes you make as an engineer or a designer to the solution. So we can keep track of things so that we um, end up still with a, a reasonably optimal solution. We can also do other checks on deflections, buckling, and all the rest of it using a line element representation of the model. Um, the next step is to convert the um, design into a, a continuum. So what we do is we replace the line elements with solid elements. Um, we then join the solid elements. So we put some um, connectors in at the, um, um, the intersections. It could be a simple sphere. And we expand the joints as necessary to uh, ensure that we don't have stress concentrations. Um, we could use cylindrical bars, or we could use um, other cross-sections. So here we have sort of cruciform sections. And for certain AM processes, we could potentially have hollow sections so we can um, um, have greater buckling resistance. And then finally, we can export the, the solution in um, various different formats. Um, because we've got high-level elements, high-level discrete members, um, we can have um, um, true CAD uh, output from the, from the process. Um, in terms of AM process awareness, again, because we're dealing with these high-level e high structural members, we can say, for example, that members that are, have a shallow inclination to the horizontal uh, are penalized. So we can make it more expensive to produce those ones than ones at, say, 90 degrees. And that can help us, albeit in a relatively simplistic way, to uh, take account of the um, limitations of um, certain manufacturing processes. So here we have a simple example where you can see we've got some, some very shallow inclined elements near the top. The volume is 3.67. Um, the next one, we've got elements less than 40 degrees are penalized. And uh, a slightly higher volume, but clearly one that uh, doesn't have the shallow um, inclined elements in the first one. So just run through um, a couple of examples. Um, so um, actually, I think it's coming out in the, in the October 2016 issue of Structural and Multidisciplinary Optimizations, some work by uh, Smith et al. Actually, it's, it's Smith, um, myself, and a number, a number of co-authors from the University of Sheffield, where Smith was uh, one of our PhD students. So he basically used this procedure. Um, and instead of stopping at the design stage, he um, produced fine element verification to check that the, the stresses at the joints were not uh, exceeded, and actually manufactured and tested um, the trusses that were de designed. And you can see here, this is an extract from the, the paper, we were able to get to the target design load using this uh, methodology. Another example in that same paper was um, Bloodhound supersonic car air brake hinge, um, able to find a, a design that was 70% lighter than the conventional design. And uh, more recently, uh, we've used um, software produced by the spin-out company Limit State 
uh, to produce a, 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 a perhaps more uh, rationalized uh, version of that. So just to avoid it disappearing very academic, I just want to just show you for literally one minute how the software uh, works in, in, in practice. So we've got a satellite mount example, which uh, according to uh, literature in 2014, was taking uh, almost four weeks to do the design for, and we'll do in the space of a minute, um, in real time, the whole, oh, not the whole process, a large proportion of the process. So here we have um, um, design space shown in blue. We've got rigid elements um, at the top and the bottom. First thing it's doing is it's doing layout optimization to get us a solution. And then the next stage is it's going to do geometry optimization. Currently, there's a green bar there, which I, don't, you can, you can't really, I can't read it. It's, it said 93%. So after the layout optimization, it was 93% efficient. After the geometry optimization, it's 95%. We then move into a different mode where we can actually interact with the um, design to perhaps make it more rational. So for example, remove some long, slender elements and replace them with, with shorter ones. Um, so interacting with the, with the, the model in, the, in a way that isn't nearly so easy when you're using topology optimization, and then filtering out um, uh, very small elements. Um, at this stage, you can do very validation um, of, of a model, or you can directly convert it into a, uh, a continuum uh, form ready for manufacture. So that's, that was shown in real time. It wasn't speeded up. That was on a, on a fairly bog standard PC. So you can see that using this line element approach, um, it's potentially much quicker um, to get rational trust solutions. If the optimum is a, of a trust form, why go round the houses using topology optimization? Why not actually use a trust approximation at the start and, uh, and get the benefits that, that that gives you? So just to... Uh, wrap up some conclusions. So high level structural members in the optimization simplifies the process uh, and leads to more efficient designs in less time. Particularly true when you've got lots of design freedom. If you don't have much design freedom, conventional topology optimization approaches are more suitable. Um, integrating this kind of approach in, in a CAD environment makes it easy to interact with the design and obviates the, design, the need to work with low-level meshes. And as I mentioned, uh, spin-up company that I co-founded, Limit State, has launched software um, which incorporates the approach described. Just wrap up just by giving a few uh, acknowledgments to co-workers. Uh, so Chris Smith, um, Tom Pritchard, Wild Darwich, and Lin Wei He were all former PhD students at the University of Sheffield. Uh, also, uh, Professor Ian Todd, who's actually the director of the Adams Center in Sheffield, and actually inspired me to, to come into this, this particular field. And Tom Johnson from Limit State. If you're interested in the, the technology from a more practical user perspective, there are actually um, um, stands in the, in the exhibition. Um, Limit State have a stand, and, and partner companies uh, also have stands um, which would be able to uh, discuss the technology with you. So I think that's uh, all I want to say. Thanks very much for listening to the presentation.